to um, guided face data modeling and TS export, uh, transport service export with Phenom. Um, this is Sonia Hand, and I am going to be moderating any uh, attendee questions today. Uh, Chris Alport and Sean Foley are with us today. They're the ones who are actually going to be taking us through the demo of the tool. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Chris. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Chris Alport. Hey, thanks for taking the time out to join us as, as we get to show you some of the capabilities that Scale's been working on for the last few years. And uh, we're real excited uh, for you to see how we can take a face model, a face data model, and, and take it to some code that passes uh, the conformance tool suite and and uh, and gets you going on uh, your your face verification or face alignment requirements. I'm one of the co-founders here. I've spent the last 10 years or so of my life uh, in data modeling land. Once upon a time, I wrote software, but they don't let me do that anymore. So uh, we have we have skilled engineers to, to take care of that. One of them being uh, Sean Foley. He's one of the brain trusts behind. Uh, everything you're going to see today. So, Sean, you want to say hi? Sure. sure. I'm Sean, as Chris said, uh, here at Scale, and uh, I'll be talking more later. So, where are we starting and what are we doing today? Um, we're starting from the perspective that uh, you may be an integrator or you may be um, an application developer and you've received a dot .face file and now you need to do something with it. You need to develop some software. Maybe, um, maybe you need to build the transport service, or maybe you need to uh, develop an application, um, some sort of like a mirror application that will communicate with the application you're receiving. And of course, we want to do so so that we end up with a face aligned application that you can then take through conformance relatively easily. And, and that's our objective for today. And we're going to just walk through how our tools make that possible. So we're going to start here in Phenom. And uh, when we start up, we don't have a model loaded for our project right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pop over to our model management tab. And I'm going to go in here to our model manager and create a new model. Now today we're going to be using a, a small model. And we're going to do that to keep um, some of our, our CTS runs quick. Um, obviously, you know, we're used to dealing with much larger models, but here we're going to do a data stack 4586 model. We'll load the dot face file here. And we're going to create the model in Phenom. Now, we cannot directly use the model yet. So think about this uh, kind of like a, a, uh, an integrated development environment uh, for software where you have to have a project that includes your source files. You don't just go in and start using your source files right away. So we'll go over to our project manager. Here, 4586 project. And we have to choose what models will be in this project. So I'm gonna choose the static 4586 model that we just created. We'll create the project. And now we have to choose our active project. So um, we only had one project in here that was the Chris project. And uh, so I'll switch over to the, the 4586 project. And now we're in that scope. Now, Sean and I are gonna be working collaboratively throughout this demonstration. And so I don't have to do it later. I'm going to go ahead and grant Sean permissions on my model. I'm going to give him full admin privileges as opposed to just uh, read only or write only or read write pri privileges. Okay. So when I hand this over to Sean, he's going to have access to this model and he'll be able to do everything with it that I can do. Now, we have a pretty good assurance that the model was valid because it imported without any, without any errors. But what we also want to do here in Phenom is run over to our health check. And we're going to do uh, just basically uh, just a real simple health check to make sure that there's nothing unexpected in the model. So we ran 29 different checks on the model. We identified zero issues. So this is probably the best model we've ever run through, through Phenom. 
uh, and we, we completed that in, uh, really quickly. Now, before jumping over uh, into to the next part, um, I just want to show you that we, we did import a model that had one existing UOP. And this UOP is, is formed as a subscriber. And just looking through here, we can see um, we're transmitting this, this message called inertial states, and this will be inbound, as you would expect from a subscriber. So I think, Sean, at this point, it's your turn, and we can turn things over to you. Brilliant. So as Chris mentioned, uh, now I have permissions on this model. I will refresh this page here so that it shows up in my, my project list. And I have not, yes, I was logged out. We'll log back in again. That's fine. And I'll switch to the project that we just created. Now, as Chris mentioned, uh, one of the first things we're going to be going through is showing that this runs through the CTS and showing that we're generating code that we can use to get up and running fast. So my background's more on the on the software engineering side and some past lives. I did a lot of training classes. And one of the first things a lot of people want to show me the code, you know, you know show, me, uh, show me what I get out of this. So we'll start there, but we're going to start with the, the CTS and we'll explain why in a second here. So uh, there are a few other artifacts that Phenom has. The, the mock UOPs represent code skeletons that will generate essentially getters, setters, send, receive, you know, all of those connections that the UOP uses to, to communicate with the outside world. We will include sync source, and we actually won't include a main here because for this first round, we're just going to run this through the CTS and show what's necessary to get that set up. Uh, we'll come back later and uh, get another publisher and include main so we can actually send things back and forth. Lots of, uh, lots of acronyms in this, apologize for that, but a uh, conformance test suite. So this is part of what you would need to do to get your code, your unit of portability or, or other units of conformance like a TS, a transport service, um, and uh, iOS service uh, through the, the verification process and face. So this is, this is downloading here. I will open that and this uh, this share you see on Windows, this is just a CentOS VM. We've had much better luck running the conformance test suite from CentOS. Uh, so we will extract this here. We're using the uh, 3.0 um, conformance test suite provided by the Open Group. So this is what we get uh, in this bundle. We do, we see a lot there and recall that's why I checked the, the sync source earlier. That's actually where most of these are coming from. So as part of sync uh, scales, transport service implementation, we get, uh, you know, simple configuration services, some common directories, uh, a few TPMs. Um, these are the sources for the TS, the UOP itself that mock UOP that we just generated is going to live inside here. And we can open up this, it's essentially these stub functions I mentioned earlier. So what does a UOP need to do? So ours implement some of the, the LCM or lifecycle management APIs, such as initialize, um, configuration, uh, injected references, so the integrator supplies the interfaces to the, the particular typed TS uh, APIs used to send and receive data. And do periodic, this is where you could actually, well, do something. Now, I will note this is not a face API. Uh, the way that UOPs are run is, is up to the UOP and the integrator to agree on. 
uh, other variants that aren't used here. You could say uh, call a, a start or launch method that might create a new thread in the background. It could be a blocking call. You know, these mechanics are up to the UOP provider and the integrator. So this is the code we've generated for the UOP. There's also configuration that actually matches this up with a transport service. And the next thing we'll be looking at, uh, this is an important one, this PCFG file is a configuration for the conformance test suite. So the first thing we're going to be doing is taking this generated uh, mock UOP and just showing how we can run this through the phase conformance test suite. So one of the things to note here, uh, we'll look at the contents of that project file soon, but before we can do that, uh, some of those files or some of the configuration is actually installation specific. The most important one being, where is your face CTS installed? So we can generate configuration for the mock UOPs. We don't know where you've installed the CTS. So the setup script, I've set that as an environment variable. So now we essentially do a search and replace on some of the, the file paths, include directories, stuff like that, to take into account the actual directory. And now that that's right, I can open up this, this project from within the CTS. So this uh, is a project that's testing a, a PCS, a portable, uh, portable component segment application, uh, the one we've just generated. First thing we can do is check the configuration. So I mentioned that all of those, you know, the paths and such files it expects to exist. And we're actually going to see this fail, but that's okay. Uh, I'll explain that in a second here. So it says it's invalid. And that's because some of the objects uh, that it's expecting to find that we'll be linking again shortly don't actually exist yet. Generated the sources, not these libraries. Uh, that's okay. We can go here and just touch those to appease the CTS. And now we will validate the second time. Doesn't mean the libraries are right. It's a bit of a circular process. I will explain that in a, a little bit after our first run here. Okay, so this is valid. So similar to what we did within Phenom, uh, also might be a good idea to check that the CTS thinks that your data model is valid. If the data model is valid, really a, a lot of other things are going to go wrong. The data model is what defines the interfaces, the connections between the UOP and the transport service, uh, the, the CTS needs those so that it knows what to validate against, what are the connections, the data types expected. So if this doesn't work, none of the rest is going to be happy. And Sean, it's worth mentioning here that uh, the data model that is exported is it's slightly different from the data model we're testing internal to Fina, uh, because we we obviously have to get to a face representation outside of the tool. Right, good right. point. Good. The uh, the phenom representation is actually not exactly the same as the, the face representation. Uh, we can can might get to some of that a bit later. So this is passed. That's happy. Now we can do our. I call it the dry run of the CTS. Uh, again, it's actually going to fail, but I'll, I'll explain why. And to know, to know how this works, we do need to think about the different components that the CTS is testing or the different components that are interacting. The two main ones, uh, I like to think of it as, uh, in this case, the UOP, that's the code under tests that we want to to verify is correct. And then there's the external components, the transport service, the operating system. 
So the way the CTS works, it will actually generate uh, gold standard libraries based off of the data model and some other configuration options, such as the, the face profile. It's going to create libraries for those. And then we link our UOP, our code against those libraries. That's this, this dot A that we're going to be building shortly. When we have those libraries, the CTS takes all of that together. It takes its, uh, its test suite, the gold standard libraries, uh, our library, make sure it's all compatible and, and that's really defining what conformance is. Uh, one of the quirks though, some of those libraries that we need to build, like the ones you, you see on the screen here going by a little fast, they don't actually get built until you try to run the test suite the, the first time. So that's why this one will fail, that's okay, but it's going to give us the libraries that we need. While that's, that's finishing up, I'm going to go ahead and prepare the, uh, the build system that we have for a CTS build. Uh, normally it builds, uh, you know, not against the CTS, you do actually uh, build and run. We need to do things a little differently if we're building against the CTS because now we have to link against the CTS, the CTS's gold standard libraries, its generated header files, and so forth. So I'm setting that to uh, for a CTS build. Also in this case, we're just concerned for now about getting the the generated mock UOP showing that it's conformable, we don't actually need to build the rest of the, the sync transport service. So I'll just comment those out. So this is failed, that's okay. It's given us the libraries that we need to build. Uh, we use CMIC for these. It's actually pretty convenient. It makes it a, a lot easier to do cross-platform builds. We can use you know, Windows and Linux and use all of the same uh, same build infrastructure. Okay, so we've just built the code that we saw, that sub-UOP code, against the gold standard libraries and the CTS. Now we can ask the CTS to to do all of its checks. So this, uh, this library here, we've just built that. Uh, there's other configuration that we give the CTS. This is what was generated by Phenom. You know, we know that our mock UOP support initializable, configurable, use config services. Uh, notice we didn't have to change any of these options. You know, all of these files, the directories, that's what was generated in the PCFG file and configured by that CTS setup script. So now we can do the real run. So all that's running, Sean, I just want to just touch on, on what you're saying here. So one, um, you know, all of this work that, that we're doing here in the CTS is really to prove that the code that we're generating and all of the piece parts that we're, we're generating from Phenom are giving us something that is conformable correct right you can't claim it's conformant but you know running through the cts is going would be a required part of the conformance process so the other part of, of what we're seeing here and, and this is for any of you who have experienced some of the challenges in setting up a a, a cts configuration um sean Sean has shown that we can just load that PCFG that already configures use of CTS for us. Right. I have to admit the, the first times we went through, through running our code and USCs through the CTS, there are lots of options there. Figuring out exactly the ones to use can be a bit, um, a bit challenging. Um, I think generating the configuration file is a it's nice value add from Phenom. But even just as a developer, I would have wanted the same thing because after after configuring those by hand, 
three or four times, it gets old fast. So, um, you know, we developers are lazy. If we can automate things, then, then that's great. So that's why we've generated that. And we see that this one has passed. So the, the generated UOP linking against the gold standard libraries and with those configuration options and, uh, and life is good. So stepping back a bit, we've shown uploading a face data model into phenom generating mock UOPs that pass the conformance test suite, which is a, a, a good place to be starting. Again, I recommend getting that set up earlier in projects than later. That way you, you know it's going to stay correct. But, well, it's not really doing anything yet. We have a, a lonely UOP. Uh, it's expecting data and, and no one is sending it to it. So the next thing we're going to do from Phenom is actually go ahead and create a publishing UOP. Right, so this is some of the basic editing capabilities that we provide in the tool. Again, I understand we're not we're not taking you through a lot of the phenom capabilities, but we are showing you how we can do some some management of some of these basic capabilities to get to workable code, and and that's really what we're going for there. So as Sean is building a basically a mirror image of the subscriber UOP, this time we're going to build a publisher, and we're also going to use that same inertial states message. This time it's going to be outbound rather than inbound. And we'll save that. And I think what we'll end up with is uh, from this point, we can just export an updated set of code. Right. And this time we will include our mains because we want to actually run them. Uh, again, the main code would typically be uh, written by the integrator, you know, the UOP, the business logic, doesn't need to know how am I going to be deployed? Do I have multiple UOPs in an application? What transport service am I being configured with? Those are not its uh, its responsibility to know and that those connections are made from the main program. So same thing here. You can barely see the names here, but this is the, the second one. These get named based off of the, the data model, so similar names. I will extract this into documents again on the virtual machine. So here's our new one. The directory structure is going to look pretty similar. The new thing we get here are these main programs. So we can just, we can open up one of these. So if you've made a phase three application, you might have noticed that things are uh, are pretty different from phase two or, or from many uh, infrastructure or communication frameworks. So instead of just being a library that you link against, there's a lot of dependency injection going on. Uh, and that is to get that decoupling I mentioned earlier. Everything operates on interfaces versus implementations. The main program, is where these implementations are instantiated. So the specific transport service that you're using, the specific UOPs, configurations that you're using. There's a lot of boilerplate here, uh, but that is, you know, to boil it down, I, I'd say we are creating the required objects, injecting the references, with like set reference calls that we saw earlier. And then finally down here, just, um, you know, telling it to start up. So that's the new code that we got. Back on the VM, we'll get to the new directory. This is our old one. We want the new one here. And notice there's no configuration. The, the default is not for the CTS. It's just for a normal build. Uh, we can, um, oh, oops, one more directory here. Hmm. We can make this, and it's compiling, this time it's compiling uh, more things, a real transport service, because we're going to want to, to send and receive data, it takes a little longer this time. While that is running, I'll go ahead and 
and get some other things in order because uh, we saw those those stubs earlier we could run this it's not going to do anything it doesn't actually send or receive some data we need to tell the uop what to do phenom can know that the data types you are sending or receiving it can know the connections but we have no clue what the actual data you want to be sending is you know, the, the values of those so we're going to fill some of that in uh, so you don't see me making lots of typos we've uh we've got some examples of that already here that will pop into this do periodic method so here's my demo code here's my publisher okay and we'll do the same thing on the subscribing side if you've worked with uh maybe qt or other uh, other frameworks like that i think of it in a similar way you know you can have a, a gui you define the buttons that are there um you know where things are placed and then you get these stub codes you know on on event on click stuff like that so the the mock ups are similar we can spit out the uh, the functions and then you can fill in what goes inside okay so uh, now we can run this with our uh, our make again and you know we get a compile error um that's because some of the the demo code that i have copy pasted uh, doesn't match up with the connection i made in phenom we made that new uop the new message port well it's generated code so how does the computer know what to name these variables well we could guess we could call them connection one connection two and so on but that gets tedious so the code is actually based on the model content uh when i was working the model uh, i believe i named this in the publisher something other than inertial states which yeah is sean i think you this, typed uh, inertial yep so, um the programmer error of typing integer too many times. Yep. Yep. So there's our intentional. You could say it was intentional. <laughs> okay. So now I'll fix that. And now this should actually build. Yay. So we've built our, our publisher and subscriber. Uh, in this other shell, I'll get to the correct directory here to run this. Start up our subscriber, start up our publisher. And we see that our incredibly creative uh, data that we're sending is going across. So the, the things to note here, uh, in addition to just running the CTS, you know, to getting the, the CTS configuration, the mock UOP code, Phenom is also spitting out a transport service. That's how we're actually uh, effecting this communication. Now, in reality, some of these things would be better configured from, from other parts of Phenom, uh, integration model in particular, but that's not a required artifact in face models. And so when we generate these, we have to make some assumptions. Uh, in this case, those assumptions would be each UOP goes into its own main program. Um, you're not necessarily realistic, but the simplest thing to do. Uh, and uh, we pick the UDP transport to use. Uh, the sync, the transport service is, uh, is configured to use a UDP TPM with some some default multicast addresses and ports so in a real system of course you would need to configure those but you know we we just do some defaults out of the box to get things running quickly so right so it, it was a, a functional system with a uop talking to another uop and really the the sum total was we had to populate the do periodic functions and then build the software 
Right. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, really, it was the CTS part that took longer because we had a few of those uh, extra steps. The um, yeah, the just the publisher and subscribers pretty fast. Um, so one so last thing I was talking about the transport service that we uh, that we generated. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of the the CTS projects for these. There are about uh, five or six projects you need to build uh, for the because RTS is implemented as a modular with, uh, TS with different UOCs representing uh, TPMs, type abstract, type specific. You need to to do the same clicking and waiting in um, in the CTS about six times. So I did this one earlier, but it you know it is showing that in addition to the UOCs, the sync transport service uh, also gets through the CTS. Uh, this one takes a while to run, so we can let it it sit there a bit. Um, but wanted to point out the transport service uh, conformability as well. So not only are the the applications uh, conforming or conformable, but so is the underlying TS that's being generated. Now, every time we see uh, these tests being run in in CTS. Well, you know, that that data model test is being repeated. So, you know, although we, we did run the data model by itself just to show that it was conformant or that it passed the test, it's still uh, being run in this whole automation uh, just to get from from the basically the full set of tests here in CTS. So we we are seeing that a data model get run through several times and as well as the other uh, tests needed, the generating of the the libraries, and then checking all of the APIs, uh, the type abstract APIs, the, the lifecycle management APIs, and, and everything else within. Uh, it's also checking to make sure, I think you're using, um, is it safety base profile, Sean? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Um, we can actually, uh, I meant to show this earlier, but we can, the, the run from earlier, we can actually show exactly what was was going in there. Yeah, so we're running the safety base profile. And with that in mind, it's checking to make sure that the appropriate APIs are being allowed and that no, you know, illegal APIs are being used. Yep, this is the report from the previous, uh, just the UOP. You can see that was, uh, yeah, just a bit ago. And it prints out a lot of information about its configuration. Um, this is really the same stuff that's in the config file in a, I guess, maybe prettier format, but a canonical format at least. And it shows all of those options. Now, for instance, that it's using LCM initializable, that it links against the gold standard libraries, it uh, implements injectable and so forth. And we can see the same thing for that, um, for the, the CTS that just ran. Let's double check that it passed, but it showed it did earlier, uh, but that passes and we can see that report uh, here. So this is the, the corresponding report for the transport service, just ran that. And again, the transport service is probably, I haven't done an, an OSS segment, but, um, there are lots of options in the transport service. The, the PCS is a bit simpler, um, but there are many ways a TS can be implemented. So those, are, those take a little longer to run. Great, so um, I do already have a few questions. Let's see, I guess one of the questions is, can Phenom generate Java UOPs? Ah, uh, uh, not yet. Uh, however, a lot of the uh, a lot of the implementation is very generic. Uh, we use uh, more generic representations of data types, uh, a lot of templating. So it's uh, it's in the plan, but just C++ for now. 
Okay. Um, another question is, we focused a lot on the um, in phenom kind of the setup of the project and then generating the transport service. What does phenom do to help in guided development of data models? Yeah, great question. So uh, when it comes to to actually populating the data model content itself, a uh, phenom does a number of different things. Uh, one of the things that it does is it it limits your degrees of freedom to only allow for acceptable choices. So basically, it it ensures that you're creating uh, valid data models with valid content, and it also uses the model that you develop to help with the documentation of your interfaces. And there are a number of other tools within Phenom that that will. Um, it really help you along. We we have we have diagramming, as well as as a uh, very detailed view, and we will we will be doing demonstrations in the future that focus more on the data modeling side of things rather than than the code generation side of things. Okay, is it possible just to show a screenshot of what that looks like? Yeah, can you go into a details view, Sean? Of uh, yeah, sure. So here's a detailed view of, oh, of the view, um, the interface, inertial states V1. And, and you see in here, this is, um, now everything in here is stored in an interface 2.1 format. Uh, we do a lot of work with, with projection paths, um, but when we, we work with phase 3.0, we do the appropriate up conversion into a query template, a corresponding query template. Great. Um, actually, that aligns with another one of the questions, which is what versions of FACE does Phenom support? Good question. So, uh, FACE, or, or Phenom rather, uh, is able to import FACE 2.1 and FACE 3.0 files. Uh, I'm actually not sure if we can import FACE 3.1 files yet. Uh, if not, it, it's very soon to be released. Uh, and we do export phase 2.1, phase 3.0, and phase 3.1 data models. Okay. Let's see. Is Phenom, oh, in the beginning, you talked about um, that you guys were going to work collaboratively. Is Phenom a desktop app? Is it, um, is it hosted somewhere in particular? Sure. Phenom is provided as an online tool to basically allow for better collaboration between teams and uh, I think we've all seen that that a lot of a lot of our teams have become a bit more um, distributed over the last year and a half scale does have some options for customers that may need to have this in a, a disconnected uh, deployment so if you're working in a skiff or something on a program it is possible to have an enterprise deployment of phenom Super. Super. We've got a question. Um, if I regenerate the code, do I need to re-add my changes in the UOP after the code is regenerated? Currently, you would. Uh, however, we are working on reorganizing the file structure because, yeah, it would be much more convenient if, say, that um, do periodic method, if we, if we cleanly split out here are the pure boilerplate functions for uh, handling injected references or um, initialization, things like that, and put the, the user logic in a completely different file. Um, I, uh, the design has that in mind. You know, I can open up our, our sub UOP here. Um, we actually implement our, our base class. So uh, a lot of these could be implemented. You could put the, the implementation of some of the files or, or some of these functions in, in this CPP file, you could put others, uh, you could have this do periodic in a different file, as long as they all get linked together, well, the, the linker is going to be happy. Um, so yeah, from what we just saw, you would this would get overwritten, uh, but we are planning on making that a, a little cleaner split, so it's file by file, so you wouldn't need to do that. Okay, um, we have a question. Is there a way to run the CTS tool from a command line? If anyone knows, I'd love to know. Not that I know of. And I think Stu might be online. 
I don't, I don't believe so. I mean, so when you say run the CTS, I mean, does that mean the CTS as a whole? Um, in other words, if you have a configuration, all of the um, report, important pieces that are needed for validating a USM specifically, things like that, then I don't think there is a way. Um, now, if you're looking to do something like validate a data model, um, a, a dot .face file that is, there are tools um, within the CTS that can be run from the command line. Um, but as a whole, I don't think there is a way to run the CTS from, you know, just do everything from a, a simple command line interface. Thanks, Stu, for jumping in there. Um, we have another question on the CTS, uh, well, related to the CTS. How does the Phenom Model Health check compare with CTS? Does it perform all of the same checks as CTS? Sure. So it, it, it's a little bit different. Uh, as Sean mentioned, uh, we have a slightly different internal representation. And as such, Phenom ensures that certain things are always going to be valid. And therefore, we don't make certain checks. Uh, we do not run all of the checks that CTS does, but it does do a fair number of them. And it always includes some of the longer checks that, that CTS um, performs, like the entity uniqueness and actual uniqueness checks. And does the health check provide any additional information on what is wrong or how to fix it? Yeah, sure. So uh, on the right side, uh, when, when there are issues in your model, uh, you'll actually get a count of the issues and there will be a little drop down box. In some cases, there are automatic fix ups we can provide. So you can just click fix this. And uh, I think one of the examples is uh, entities without a unique identifier. So about four more lines down, Sean. Uh, when that one occurs, uh, that's a really simple fix up. We can just say, you know, add unique identifier to all entities. It's a one click operation and then that problem is solved. Now, if for some reason you didn't want to automatically add that to all of them, uh, you still have the option to do it on a, uh, you can do it to each one you know, individually or you can even go into the individual pages and edit them. Um, the, my favorite one is the, there's a specialization inconsistency. So when we upgrade a model from 2.1 to 3.0, uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done to fix some of the generalization and specialization structure of the model. So right here, Phenom identifies some of those potential problems and it actually gives us a, a number of just different options that we have to properly fix that. And then once we fix it, we can rerun the health check and see how we're doing. So um, one of the questions is here is asking about what are some of the um, collaboration features related to data modeling in Phenom? Okay, so, so we have lots of different collaboration uh, one aspect of the collaboration is that um, as I shared that model with Sean when we first loaded up, um, he's able to now operate on that model just as I am. Now, if I wanted to let him have this model in a reduced capacity, um, Sean, can you just give Riley read access, for example? So if, if Sean were to give Riley read only access, well, Riley would be able to include content from this model in his work, but he wouldn't be able to make any changes. So there's a little bit of, of you know, ability to constrain that sharing. Uh, furthermore, uh, Phenom has some um, configuration management capabilities that allow us to share specific versions of a model or a project. And, and then additionally, we have something that's it's similar to software version control in that you can uh, branch and pull and push changes to a model and this is usually done when you have a little bit more of a an approval process that you want to implement as an organization uh, many of our customers seem to just use one uh, shared uh, you know, model they, they share one access to the model so they're they're collaboratively editing the same model Sean, did you want to add to that? 
Uh, yeah, I'll make a point that, that kind of relates to a few of those things about the, the collaboration. Um, I'll, I'll have to stop myself. I could geek on, on this a lot because it's a, a fun problem. But one of these other health checks we saw is this idea of uh, deprecations. So uh, in many ways, you, at a high level, you could think of it like source code version control. Uh, for models, it gets tricky when we have very, very interrelated elements, uh, essentially a large graph. Uh, what happens when you delete something and someone else who's branched off of your code or forked off of that needs it? Well, if it doesn't exist anymore, and let's say you're referring to a measurement system or referring to a, a view characteristic that just doesn't exist anymore, um, you know, some of those can get pretty complicated. So we've introduced some ideas such as deprecation. So you can signal to other people on the team, hey, I fixed this, please don't use it. And we get a, a health check for that. So there are, are some things in this health check that are phenom specific like deprecation or placeholders. Um, and the, the reasons for some of those are largely around this collaboration to make some of those workflows better instead of needing to have, for example, a, um, I've worked on models where the, the collaboration was a giant lock or emailing around the one true, uh, the true zip file of the model um, that, that gets old fast. So we were working on some workflows in Phenom to deprecate, to make changes without unduly affecting uh, other people. And how often do changes and um, improvements to Phenom come out? Rolling on about a, a three-week sprint for for Phenom releases. Okay, great. So every three weeks, subscribers get get upgraded features or updates. Okay. So we have a um, question: Do any of the TPMs you generate work under Windows? Uh, yes. Also. Um... If you remember, I, I love Linux and the command line, so I, I really appreciate the question about the CTS. Um, but we are developing in both Windows and GNU Linux for the CTS. So we have uh, all of the TPMs. Yeah, we'll work on both Windows and uh, and Linux. Um, you know, one note about those is we have the, the, the license for those can be separate. Uh, you know, we generate code using TPMs. Um, but for, you know, AMQP, I think that's probably fine, you know, for DDS, you know, we would need to get those libraries separately, but we have tested that they do work on Linux, uh, on Windows. Right. Um, why would one convert a 2.1 USM to a 3.0 USM? So we mentioned that earlier. Why would one want to do that? Probably legacy. So you had a, maybe a, a 2.1 uh, well, component, uh, and thus a 2.1 data model for it, and you want to, or maybe require to, uh, use that in a 3.0, I was going to say 3.0 system. That That's, uh, I shouldn't say that, if it's not really a concept of a, a 2.1 or 3.0 system, uh, but it, it could be that if the, if more of the components are uh, aligned to phase 3.0, you know, perhaps your life is easier if you uh, if you do the same, um, but you can certainly have two, one, and three O components interoperating. You could have a, a transport that allows that. You could have bridge applications, gateways. You know, nothing, nothing within face disallows it. But for some of those reasons of common code bases, um, things within three O that are just um, better. In many ways, you, you might want to upgrade your code to be 3.0 aligned instead of a phase two. Great, thank you, Sean. Um, another question on the collaborative work. So, Chris, you were talking earlier about um, merging and branching models. Um, do we have, does Phenom have model diff merge? Yeah, so one of the features, now we, we don't have a full, um, a full diff and merge capability in the tool. But what we do have is what we call a naive merge. And and the naive merge will, um, it helps us merge 
two models that may have some similar relationships, as in maybe they they came from the same shared data model. Um, so we we start our analysis there with uh, an, with a GUID based analysis. So the globally unique identifiers on each of the the entities in the dot face file. And then we, we go through and we attempt to merge the contents of those models. And there is an option essentially for the, the new content to overwrite existing content or to retain the existing content. It's kind of a, a, a big operation uh, at one time. Um, we, we have offline done some model merge and we just haven't found a really good user-friendly way to bring that into, into Phenom yet. But it's definitely something we've spent a lot of time looking at. Okay. And is and is continuing to be worked on, Chris? Would yeah, always. Coaching? Definitely. Yeah, yeah I, and and by the way, um, when um, whenever I get stuck and I think I can't do something, I usually go back to my dev team and I ask them, well, well, how would I go about doing this type of merge? And and just about every time, uh, they've been they've pointed me to. Uh, the naive merge with a different, just kind of slightly different workflow. And, and I'm able to solve most of my problems over there. And just a note that that is part of, um, of a Phenom subscription as well is ongoing support to be able to get that from even directly from the dev team. I think that's one thing that our customers mention a lot um, is how strong our support team is. We have another question about all those acronyms. So what is TPM? Uh, TPM is a transport protocol module. It is the way face, uh, within the face software architecture, uh, you can decouple much of the transport service logic from the the lower level implementation. Um, now, that part's fairly common. I've seen that tons in, in main communication infrastructures, but by specifying the API for it, it actually allows you to exchange TPMs. So you can, in, in, instead of just being a, you know, say um, a 1553, UDP, DDS, AMQP, you know, pick your pick your transport, um, you can actually exchange that TPM. So another transport service can communicate with your transport service because the TPM is what lets them agree on the on the on the wire you know, bits and bytes. Great, thank you. Um, all right, we are up against our time. I have one final question, and the question was: Is there a public demo or something publicly available to show how to um, data model uh, in Phenom how, and how to use Phenom? Um, right now, we currently do not. However, we are planning on having additional. Um, demo webinar, so we will be putting that out. We do have a webinar coming up on the June 30th. It won't be using Phenom to do that, but we will be talking specifically about data modeling in face and kind of how to get started. But if you are interested in specifically using Phenom to data model to for face alignment, then you can go to uh, scale.com slash conformance um, and you can sign up for a personalized demo in which we can go over whatever details you need we can show you whatever, you know, answer any questions specifically. And we're also providing uh, complementary alignments um, to face kind of gap assessment. So where are you now versus where do you need to be to be, um, uh, you know, aligned with face. And um, that is a kind of a high level, but it will provide you a starting point in terms of, you know, what kind of what are the next steps you need to take to be able to be aligned with face. So feel free, you can go to that website or you can also just email us. Um, you can email sales at scale.com and we'll be able to contact you and set that up for you. Chris and Sean, do you have anything remaining to say? No, just thanks again for your, your attention and the opportunity to share our tools with you. Have a fantastic day.